Jackson. I am the chair. Oh, we go. <laughs> I am the chair of the ASAP, ASAP which is the um, American AA Strategic Advisory Panel for the AANA, uh, and I have been for the last couple of years, and have run the strategy nationally for probably five or six years for the ANA. Um, we fought AA bills in my state in Arizona. Uh, and so I've helped with probably every AA bill that has existed since I started this role. So there's been a lot of them. And uh, over the time, we've learned a lot of things from how these guys present things. And what I'll start with is just kind of a basic overall presentation, a little bit about AAs, a little bit about strategy, and then we'll have a conversation. You can ask me specific questions. I'll jump right into that. Let me figure out how to, here we go. Where's that sucker? There we go. So many screens. Okay. <laughs> so are you guys able to see that okay or do i need to move the there does that look right to you or are you seeing the one with the numbers on it no it looks good all right good all right i have two screens one above me one above that and the one in front of me so you got all kinds of stuff going on so political you know anesthesiologist sisters are effectively become a political tool for the asa and we'll talk a little bit about the history about the asa and what's happened with anesthesiologist assistants. These uh, AAs started out of a uh, workforce study that was done in the 1960s by two physician anesthesiologists who were extremely politically active. And at that time, CRNAs were really starting to get very, um, very busy in the anesthesia community. This is prior to TEFRA guidelines, CMS setting guardrails and how things worked. So what was happening is physician anesthesiologists could have 50 CRNAs working in a hospital and they wouldn't even have to be there. There was no requirement to bill for their services. And CRNAs at that time couldn't bill directly. But there was a big push for facilities to hire the CRNAs themselves. And so physician anesthesiologists worry about effectively their jobs. And they decide they needed a quote unquote mid-level who could never work with anyone else but them. And CRNAs at that time could work under the supervision of the surgeon. Uh, coincidentally, at that time, the uh, American um, uh, College of Surgeons was probably the biggest supporter of CRNAs in the country and uh, and fought against the AMA at that time because the ASA didn't exist. So the first training programs for AAs opened up in about 1968, 1970, where their first graduates. So, you know, 50 years later, that's the two. It was Emory University and Case Western University, uh, one in Ohio, of course, one in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was where they initially started with about 10 people that graduated from each this is that original uh, manpower study they did shortly afterward in 1974. And in the manpower study, the ASA twisted how things worked and, and talked about how there was a shortage of providers, but never included CRNAs as anything but dependent providers, which, of course, confirms their narrative, right? So what is an AA? Uh, an AA per the Quad A, the American Academy of Anesthesiologist Assistants, is the exact same as a CRNA, can do everything a CRNA can do, except for that AAs only believe in the anesthesia care team statement and are only interested in working directly under and with physician anesthesiologists in the care team. So they have to be supervised. Uh, in the vast majority of states' supervisions, what's written into statute, it doesn't say things like medical direction or one to four or ratios. There are many states that do say those things. But for an AA to be able to be billed, under medical at all in any way, they have to be working under billing medical direction, which is maximum one to four ratio, where the physician anesthesiologist can bill 50% of up to four cases. So they bill 200% of what they would if they actually sat down and did cases them for themselves. So you can immediately see that there is a financial incentive to support a practitioner that can only work under a physician anesthesiologist and only work under medical direction. Uh, there's no other way for them to bill, so they by default have to work that way. So the AA uh, Association has had many, many different um, uh, conferences over the years. These are just the ones I left up there from 2019 and 2018. And their new thing is meet and interview and hire anesthetists. Meet your new anesthetist. Register at their website, their national website, which is anesthetist.org. So you can see that they're already, they were already in the process of co-opting the name anesthetist uh, long before this year. And, uh, you know, they used to be AA-Cs, AA certified, very much like following the PA-C that uh, that exists, the same kind of credential. And they changed that to be CAA. And that was not by uh, fluke or by, you know, you know, just a whim. It was by design and for strategy because CAA is very close to CRNA. And so it's very difficult for those who are not intimately involved 
to know the difference, right? And they're even wearing badges that say anesthetist. So a term that's not even in their title is a, is a badge that they use uh, on a consistent basis. And so there's many states out there, you know, you're trying to decide, like, how do I look at CRNAs and AAs and, and, and suggest that they're different if they both work the same way in the anesthesia care team? We have to decide, are we dependent providers or independent providers, right? CAAs, vet techs, dental assistants, all performing anesthesia under the direction and supervision of another provider. But CRNAs don't have to do that, neither do physicians, dentists, or veterinarians. So we want to be under the independent provider role. And in fact, even in an anesthesia care team, so at the most restrictive anesthesia care team you can imagine in your state, at any time, a CRNA could be split off from that billing, build QZ, which is non-medical direction, and open an additional room with no additional cost. That allows for expanding access to care in a cost-effective manner without an additional provider who's not generating revenue, the physician anesthesiologist, not actually performing anesthesia, right? So that's why many states have gone to this whole nurse anesthesiologist thing. It's been codified in, I think, 11 now, uh, and many other states can use it. There's a couple of states where the physician anesthesiologists have gone through the process of making it so you can't use the anesthesiologist in any other way. Interestingly enough, they allow anesthesiologist assistants to use anesthesiologist in their title. So it just goes to show you they're not looking to protect anesthesiologists. They're looking to keep you from being anything but an assistant in the eyes of the legislators, the public, and surgeons, stakeholders. So there's about 12 AA programs. There are four in the process of opening up different ways uh, in different areas of the process, either just starting discussions in the process or almost there and getting ready to be credentialed that we're aware of. Um, there is one in Michigan that's been talked about. But we haven't gotten any 100% confirmation. I've just been sent emails of the rumors that it's going to happen and it's rumbling and talk. But like everything where there's smoke, there's probably some fire. Um, the reason why the uh, physician anesthesiologist, the ASA and the Quad A want to open these satellite programs in new, in new states, especially states where they're under delegatory authority like Michigan is, or states that don't even have AAs at all, is to do what's called normalizing deviance. It's a strategy that's utilized in politics to make things okay, right? So basically when you when you bring someone in and you have these AA students rotating within a state that doesn't even allow AAs, well, John's a nice guy, you know, I like John. I mean, John's family comes to the, the work barbecues. He's been great. The surgeons love John. The anesthesiologists love John. The CRNAs love John. I mean, it makes it much harder when you personalize a political issue to vote against it and to rally against it. And that is part of the strategy. It's why they open satellite schools in different states that don't even have AAs. Um, and it's been successful for them with the exception of Connecticut, where they opened Quinnipiac, that then later closed because they didn't allow them per state law to rotate within the state because AAs are not licensed in the state. So that's an alternative option to uh, stopping that. If, if, it's, if it's an option in your state, your lobbyists will know best. The program lengths are 24 to 29 months. They're master's program. They're all over the place um, as far as their date. Some are as short as 24 months. So they can be considerably shorter than CRNA programs, which now average about 36 months with a doctorate. The admission requirements are like a 2.8 GPA, 3.1 preferred. They want shadowing experience if you can get it. No prior healthcare experience of any kind is required. So the first time they're ever gonna see an EKG monitor will be in their AA program where they're also learning anesthesia. And that, that goes to the idea that they really are dependent providers. Nothing wrong with that, right? Like it's okay to be a dependent provider, but then don't pretend you're equal to CRNAs who are not in fact a dependent provider. So that's where the problem comes in, right? They're very limited. You can't expect when there's one physician anesthesiologist for four AAs, if two things go wrong in two separate rooms at the same time, that they can be in two places at once. And the ASA likes to use the, the statement, when seconds count. Well, when you're not trained to work independently, when seconds count, where's the MDA uh, to save that patient? And if it's my mother, that's an issue. Now, having said that, there's no evidence that AAs are weaker, poorer, or less capable providers within a one to four medically directed practice. So we can't go and say, oh, A's just aren't safe, right? That's what the ASA does to us. And that's not an appropriate strategy. It then becomes very turf warish. And turf war stuff is, as your lobbyists will know, the kind of things that politicians absolutely hate.
Um, they're not required to have any specific degree to get an AA school. So this is an AA. I actually know this guy. Uh, he was a bartender at Chateau Elan Winery and Resort prior to AA school, which in fact is experience because anesthesia by Budweiser is a real thing. We've all seen it. <laughs> and uh, this is another one at Emory. This is the Emory Twitter account. This girl prior to becoming an AA was a dancer, like a ballet dancer and a photographer prior to becoming an AA. And clearly it's not something they're concerned about because they, they, post this on their public accounts, as opposed to an RN taking care of the sickest patients in the ICU, the ER, or the helicopter in a, in a facility. This is what the experience prior to that is. And you can't put a quantitative value on how important that experience is. The requirements for admissions, generally the pre-med classes, although not all of them, the GRE or MCAT, although there's no minimum score for most of their programs, the, they obviously have to pay their initial tuition. And as of 2022, it's about 350 AA students per year. Uh, they were accepted in AA programs. And so these are people that were never licensed in healthcare in any way, necessarily have any experience, but come into uh, an AA program for the first time, learning what EKG stands for and learning what anesthesia is for your mom or dad. They have to have 2,000 hours of experience, but I'll talk about those clinical hours uh, a little bit later here in this short presentation. They uh, have basic sciences, basic healthcare courses. You know, they're trained to assist. They're a dependent provider. So what are some of the program requirements? You know, they do very similar stuff to, to CRNAs, two to four week rotations, uh, it's a little shorter than ours, must take board exam, research every six years. They can actually take their certification exam for licensure 180 days before they even graduate their program. That's how little apparently it matters that last 180 days of their program. You can certify with your exam before you ever start. Um, you know, the, they're learning a lot of things for the first time what an IV is, how to put one in, what a lab test is, what the lab tests mean, what the name is, what the ranges are. Uh, you know, learning about normal ranges of vitals. They don't know what a normal blood pressure or heart rate or saturation or end tidal CO2, all these things that we take for granted that RNs come with knowing. They're learning advanced life support for the first time. Oh, and in that same 24 to 30, you know, to 28 months, they also have to learn anesthesia, which CRNAs spend the entire 36 months learning. So very, very different focus on training. Uh, again, nothing wrong with training to be a dependent provider, and I'm not anti-A by any stretch of the imagination, but I am unapologetically pro-CRNA, and I, I don't like the suggestion that we are the same because we are not. So the 2,000 hours that they talk about, very misleading. AAs count every hour they're in the hospital. Similar to how you see physician anesthesiologists from the ASA say they've got 12 to 16,000 hours. That's also uh, totally inaccurate. On average, per the ABA, their credentialing committee, physician anesthesiologists do 55 hours a week in their entire uh, program. So there's no way they can reach 10,000 hours, let alone 16,000. But when you count a 24-hour shift as 24 hours, even if you never did a single anesthetic for that 24 hours, those hours add up magically. Conversely, we count hours based on the start of an anesthetic to dropping them off and pack you. And so it looks like we have less hours, but in truth, we have over 8,000. So those claims of hours are pretty difficult to talk to legislator about. You're in the weeds with that stuff and they don't care, frankly. So it's not worth it to focus on. It's just to say, well, actually our hours are about 8,000. So we're very close to 12,000 that they suggest they have and far more than an AA. Now, I mentioned that they said that, you know, AAs are equal to CRNAs because the background as an ICU ER nurse doesn't matter, except for in their own handbooks, they have PACU rotations with the RNs to learn about taking care of post-anesthesia patients. They have IV rotations with the RNs to learn how to place IVs. And many of the programs have ICU rotations of all of two weeks where they learn a, a little bit about ICU and what happens there. So they seem to think that it's important enough for them to review it. Uh, a lot of people wonder, can, a, can an AA do an epidural for a labor patient? Can they do blocks, all those things? And the answer is yes, they can be delegated. Anything that the physician anesthesiologist can do can be delegated to an AA unless there's statute or rule or hospital policy that limits what they can do. They are not PAs. The AAPA, who now call themselves physician associates, to remove the suggestion that they assist somebody, no longer PAs, physician assistants. Nationally, they're physician associates because uh, words matter. 
they uh, wrote a whole article on how physicians at that time, assistants and anesthesiologists assistants in distinction. And the bottom line of that article was the only similarity between AAs and PAs is they were both supervised by physicians and have the word assistant in professional titles. So when an AA says something to the effect of when you're in the legislature, you're testifying, you know, hey, or they tell, uh, you know, a legislator in their office, we're like the PAs of anesthesia. The answer is you're not like the PAs of anesthesia. And that's what the PAs say. And we have it in writing. Um, and the PA, the AAPA is more than willing to say that as many times as we need them to, because they don't see themselves as the same. Uh, as of 2021, this is from the Quad A, the AAA Society. Uh, at that time, there was somewhere around 12 to 13 programs, four more in um, in progress, and there were um, about 3,400 CAAs across the country as of today, with about three between three and 350 uh, in training. And of course, they're opening more programs and expanding the ones they had, so they're looking to get them bigger. And their ultimate goal is to increase by 10% year on year for the next 20 years, as far as numbers. So that requires opening programs like the potential one in Michigan. How do they practice? Well, it depends where they work. In all states that they have that they practice in, with the exception of Texas, Michigan, and Kansas, Kansas has no AAs practicing because it's controversial whether they can actually practice this way or not. They practicing under delegatory authority in Michigan and Texas, which is a broad power that the medical board provides to anesthesiologists, physicians in general, to effectively delegate to anyone, anything, anytime that they want. And as long as the facility is willing to credential that person, then they can work in the state. Uh, every other state is licensed. And that's just the list of them there. So there's a total of 20 states where, uh, well, 20 places, let me put it that way, where AAs can practice. 15, 15 of them are licensure by licensure, three are delegation, and the District of Columbia and Guam are places where AAs can practice. So they did get the authority to work in the VA. So you may hear them utilize the statement, well, we're also approved to work in the VA, but they are actually not approved in the way that they say. They have to be under direct supervision at all times, 24-7, 365, not like it works in the private sector. And they're not allowed to work in military hospitals. They can't be on forward surgical teams. They can't work independently in any way. And the reason why there's no AAs working in the VA today is because they're classified, their GS score is classified such that the maximum that they can get paid is $73,000 a year. Uh, CRNA's classification puts them up as high as 160. So that's why even though they can say that they're approved to work in the v in the VA, they really they really don't. And there's none in the VA because no one none of them are going to work for half of what they can make in the private sector. And uh, you can see here these are actual ads from the VA. An RN can make more than an AA, so you're not going to find any AAs working for that money. This is the actual Veterans Affair approval uh, when they brought them in and how they GS scored them and the way the Handbook of Anesthesia Services worked. Not important, just a historical fact. So why is the ASA supporting AAs? Well, I mean, there's obvious anti-competitive reasons why they're supporting AAs, right? They want to control the marketplace. CRNAs, uh, under, under the auspice of economic downward pressure on healthcare demands with expected equal access or expanded access, and cost effectiveness, the bottom line is CRNA practice across the country is expanding. Expanding both in autonomous and collaborative practices where there's no one to four medical direction, expanding in CRNA only practice. Here in the state of Arizona where I live, more than 75% of CRNAs, it's probably closer to 85 now, do not work under medical direction. Uh, it's less than 15% that work in an actual medically directed one to four practice uh, so it's full scope of practice in this state in actuality. And so that has decreased cost and expanded access in the state of Arizona. We haven't lost a single physician anesthesiologist because of all these changes. And nobody's cutting out the the, uh, the team. You know, no one's cutting anyone out of the team. But teams don't just exist with physician anesthesiologists. They exist with physician anesthesiologists and surgeons and with CRNAs and surgeons. It's still the team, right? So the ASA really... Um, did not support AAs until 2001. At that point, there were only 300 AAs practicing in the entire country with two schools. And there was a reason why the ASA came out very heavily in 2001. That's when national opt-out from the Medicare requirement for supervision was born. So it was 2001 where that actually was created. And from that moment on, the ASA became very politically active in stating that every, um, every state that has a 
uh, build or remove supervision, remove any uh, obstacles to CRNAs practicing independently or collaboratively, or to opting out, um, that they should have an AA bill. And this was the very first newsletter, uh, one of the very first newsletters they put out to the entire membership saying a case for hiring AAs when previously they were against it. Uh, the ASA paints us as interchangeable, right? They they have whole statements on their website saying there's no difference. They operate exactly the same. And in fact, um, if you were to listen to some of the ASA members at their meetings talk, they say that AAs are superior because, you know, they do what they're told and they follow the medical model and that's their focus. This was also in the ASA, one of the ASA uh, um, newsletters where they talked about academic anesthesia programs since 2010 have to live up to their obligation of developing an AA program in every place that has an opt-out. So they they literally talk about it here because one of the things they say in this same article is that independent nurse anesthesia practice will compromise the ability of anesthesiology practice to meet demands for anesthesia service or, oh my God, directly compete with existing anesthesiology practices, right? If that is not in writing anti-competitive, I don't know what is. So, you know, we have gone to the FTC about all this. I've had conversations with them. They've written articles about this. They've written amicus curies for states about how AAs are anti-competitive. They've written um, whole, there's an entire brief on APRNs and competition that was written. The FTC at this point, if this is not a priority for them. So don't expect the FTC to be jumping on board with this stuff. We've had conversations as early as two weeks ago. Um, they're They're against it. It's small fish compared to like Medicare fraud and across, a, you know, a thousands of providers in a big system, we're nothing, right? So from their perspective, limited resources, they're allocating to bigger, bigger fish. But there's other things that are happening up there. Uh, for instance, Indiana never had AAs. They finally got AAs at uh, University of Indiana, which was uh, always a place that wouldn't hire CRNAs. This guy's the program director of that AA program there. And he said they were looking for 34 AAs to work at I, IUH. But if you look really closely at the job ad on Indiana University Health, really closely, preferred specialty anesthesiologist assistant would also consider the RNA. So when AAs enter into a, uh, into a system, eventually what happens is CRNAs get pushed out intentionally. And clearly, if the concern was provide, was we need more providers, then this would never happen because it makes no sense at all, right? Why would you why would you alienate 60,000 potential CRNAs for 3,400 potential AA employees, most of which aren't leaving where they work today? So you're hoping in the future some will come to your state. In reality, that doesn't actually happen. Um, so it's about control. It's about money. I mean, the answer is money. What was the question? That should be no surprise to anybody. And it's about retaliation for the ANA and state associations trying to remove or eliminate any kind of barriers to um, free market practice for CRNAs. So it really comes down to they feel threatened, right? Right now, AAs are 100% controllable, but truly AAs are a Trojan horse. If you look right now at the at uh, legislative bills across the country, there's something like 15 states that have bills with PAs removing and systematically dismantling supervision for physician associates across the country. Like they had this same mantra only 10 years ago. I'd never work without a physician. Now they want to work without physicians. So much so that their membership has pushed for it and their national association is submitting bills across the country. So in truth, this will happen with AAs too. It's funny that they don't think it will. Um, you know, look, it's, they want to limit desirable job, CRNA jobs in desirable areas. Uh, and they so they decrease the interest in RNs becoming CRNAs and therefore will choose an AA program it's there's obvious an economic shift to everybody should work to their fullest you know possibility. Um, that's the push. So ACT practices are highly expensive. They don't expand access to care, uh, and they want to be in control of the revenue. I get it. I want to be in control of the revenue too. But it comes down to this, right? It's hard to convince a man of something when his salary depends on him not being convinced of it. And that's really the bottom line. That doesn't mean physician anesthesiologists are bad. Some of my best friends are physician anesthesiologists. And we've had these conversations a thousand times. Um, the fact is, is they get it, right? And I get it. <laughs> it is what it is. And so the bottom line is, if it's going to be you or me, it's going to be you. And that's the perspective that they have on a personal level because they're thinking of their families. The real villain is the National Association or the State Association. That's who's telling lies, not individuals generally.
So what are some of the ASA strategies? So I just updated this while we were talking earlier, 14 states this year, uh, and three, three already died. Uh, and New Mexico and uh, South Carolina are states that actually have limited the ratio under which an AA can work. One's one to two, one's one to three. And they are, they have tried to unsuccessfully up to this point to expand that ratio to one to four. So while that might be an economic stopgap for a short period of time, in Florida, it only lasted one year. So it really doesn't change the landscape much. They're looking to open satellite schools. The more states in AA, AA practice, AAs get into, the easier it is to get in the next state. That's that normalizing deviance thing. Uh, there's no peer review studies on them. They point to a couple different studies. We'll talk about some of those. There's the Kentucky Commission report, which is just a state report talking about, you know, are AA safe? And, you know, basically they said there were no peer-reviewed studies saying that they're safe or not. So no one really knew. And what the ultimate decision was, is it wasn't a public, uh, is, is on that uh, Kentucky study, is that uh, they said that there's no real evidence one way or another that they're safe or not. And so until there is in Kentucky, can, Kentucky is one of the few, the only place where in order for an AA to work, they also have to be a physician associate. So there are currently no AAs practicing in that state because of that. But that law could be changed. There's the Ohio study, which wasn't a study, but an internal data review at Cleveland, uh, of course, Case Western University, one of the original AA programs. Uh, wasn't really a design study per the chairman of anesthesiologists who, uh, of anesthesiology, Howard Nierman, who was asked about it. So we weren't allowed to see any of the data it was retrospective. Looks good on paper, though. 46,000 cases split between CRNA and AA. But the truth of the matter was that it was just an internal study and really showed no difference in complication rates. Um, there was no randomized for severity. There was no data released. You weren't allowed to look at the data and look at the methodology because it was an internal review, so it was protected. So you couldn't even see if it was all basically fudged. Um, and no one had any idea how involved the MDAs were in e either case. Wasn't peer reviewed. In 2018, they put out the most uh, recent study, Anesthesia Care Team Composition and Surgical Outcomes, which was published in perioperative medicine. And that's important because when you publish a study not in your journal, it appears to be more reasonable. Uh, and their conclusions really get your attention. The specific composition of the anesthesia care team was not associated with any significant difference in mortality, length of stay, or inpatient spending. So they point to that and say, see, they're equal. But like everything, the devil's in the details. Of 443,000 cases, uh, 421,000 of those were CRNAs, and only 21,000 were AAs, representing 5% of the data. It's barely statistically significant. And it's important what you study. They studied, they didn't study it. They studied inpatient mortality, length of stay, and inpatient spending. They did not study anesthesia mortality, specific mortality. So if you were in the facility because of a trauma and you went through the OR and then you went up to the floor and died of a PE. That's what they studied. They didn't study that you were in the OR and anesthesia had a problem and then there was an issue. So that's not that's not what happened. So there wasn't it wasn't studied in an appropriate way. They didn't study anesthesia morbidity mortality. They didn't study how often the physician anesthesiologist had to rescue the AAs. In fact, they don't even know the involvement of any AA, um, any MDA in any case. So pretty unconvincing study, and we've debunked that pretty significantly. I'm going to skip past this one. What are some of the things that don't work with legislators? I think the lobbyists will be well aware of this stuff. Disparaging AAs as people is never going to work, right? They're just people, and they're good people. I've met a number of them. They just ended up in a job. They had no idea what they were walking into. I hear this story every time I talk to them. Had no idea the political rela relationship. Had no idea that they'd be in the middle of it had no idea that they weren't equal to a CRNA. They just assumed they were, because that's what it says everywhere. Um, so when the time, you know, they graduate, this is what they're left with, and it's not their fault, right? You can't say AAs are unsafe. There's just no evidence. What we can say is there's no evidence to, to, com to truly compare CRNAs and AAs because you're comparing apples to oranges. You're trying to compare one group who can work independently and is trained to work independently with one group is a dependent provider that's not trained to work independently. It's just impossible. CRNA should always be compared to physician anesthesiologists because only those two can work independently. We shouldn't say things like, we can't have them in here because they'll take our job. While that is true, <laughs> right? the truth of the matter is that's trade protectionism and it's an, it's an anti-competitive basis. That's not why you don't want them in here. There's real reasons why you don't want them in your state. You don't want them expanding. Saying they have less education so they're not as good, 
hard to validate that. Uh, and we don't want to frame it as a turf war. So some of the new uh, arguments the ASA has been using is exactly what we talked about before I start the presentation. They're pointing to their job openings. Look at the shortage of providers in the state. Oh my God, you know, people are not getting surgery because we don't have anesthesia. Although there's almost no data that shows that people are not getting surgery because we don't have anesthesia. But um, the truth is that argument doesn't really work because if everyone who was trained in the state to perform anesthesia actually sat the stool and performed anesthesia, you would have an overage provider in the country of, of anesthesia. That, you know, right there, if you had every physician anesthesiologist, 75 to 85% of which supervise or medically direct, sit on a stool where our tax money, graduate medical education money, and the subsidized money for medical school, I don't begrudge them that, but if I'm going to pay to have you trained, I want you to do the job. Uh, so ultimately, great trained people with great backgrounds are not actually doing the job they were trained to, but instead sit and watch four other people do it who get better every day as they get worse, right? It's like every skill. If you don't use it, it degrades. So we're not doing any justice to the physician anesthesiologists out there training. We're not doing it for patients. And there's certainly no need um, to add in another provider that is clearly controversial and cannot expand access to care and is super dependent when we already have the answer within the state, right? It's to have the, the models change, frankly. Uh, the other thing they, uh, that they're saying, and this is, this is just recent, which I thought was hilarious, they're saying we cannot afford to lose more ICU RNs to CRNA programs because clearly their concern of an ICRN going to a CRNA program is going to turn RNs off of going to anesthesia entirely. That's silly, right? You know, they say that if they bring in more A's, less RNs will go to CRNA programs, and therefore we won't have an ICU RN shortage because there's a national RN shortage. Well, I think what we should do is probably have family practice, uh, physician anesthesiologist residencies decreased and not let them go to anesthesiology residencies and force them into family practice residencies because we definitely have a shortage of physicians in family practice. Obviously, that's never going to happen, right? So it's a silly argument, but they're still using it as of this year. Um, one of the big important things that happened in 2013 for us, that's a great um, a, a great argument against AAs, is that CRNAs can bill QZ. And what that means is not medically directed, right? That's what I do. I'm an independent practice CRNA. I own a group of 18 CRNAs. It's all CRNAs, three hospitals, three surgery centers. And we don't just do bread and butter cases. We do open thoracotomies, vats, everything. You name it. The only thing we don't do is hearts, heads, and neonics. Um, and we all bill QZ, right? So that means that there's no physician anesthesiologist involved in, the, in that side of the care. But it also means that you could do that at any time. So in a practice I originally worked at, there was one physician anesthesiologist. There was 25 CRNAs. And the CRNAs were all billed QZ, non-medically directed. And that one physician anesthesiologist was basically the board runner, the float, the person who would come and help out if you needed it, give you breaks, you know, maybe see a patient, take care of the PACU. So there is a way to expand access to care economically. And that's it, right? It already exists. Again, something they're choosing not to take advantage of. An additional thing that we're seeing um, uh, states practices not choosing not to take advantage of is using nurse anesthesia residents in a one to two ratio. So CMS allows a CRNA to supervise two nurse anesthesia residents doing anesthesia. Now, if you just take two seconds on the math there, for every CRNA, you get a free room. It doesn't cost anything that you don't need a provider for, expands access to care at zero cost, right? So from the perspective of that, of the bottom line, you can't get providers. This resolves that problem. Again, already a pre-existing solution that you're not taking advantage of. Additionally, you'll find in many states, including here in Arizona, there are whole hospitals that don't have nurse anesthesia residents rotating at all, and they're not training them. And when they choose not to train them, they're choosing to be a part of the shortage, right? If you're if you're if you're worried about a shortage that I think is artificial, but you're worried about it, then wouldn't you want to train people who already want to stay in the state? So instead of doing that, they're choosing not to do that. And then goes to what their actual motivations are. Right? It has nothing to do with the shortage. Has nothing to do with expanding access to care. Has nothing to do with patients. It has to do with money. So there are some options that people have. You can fight to kill AA bills every year. I'm going to tell you that that over time wears on the membership like anything that is constant over and over again. And eventually the, the AAs and the MDAs get better at that argument. 
That's one option, although it is a definitive win and people feel good about that. So that's one thing you can do. Texas is the longest running defense. And I think they're in their 12th defense or 14th defense of not having AAs, but they actually have delegatory authority in states. So they're already in the state, but they're stopping them from becoming licensed, right? Because licensing, delegatory authority is a step in the state, but licensing kicks the door open. So that's the uh, key there. Another thing I like to talk about all the time, especially in uh, states that are about, you know, they're generally Republican states, but not always, um, about deregulation, removing barriers, inviting people to come work in our state, opening our state for everybody to work in. It sounds like the panacea for an AA bill, right? Oh, yeah. You know, of course we want them to come in. I don't care if there's only 10 of them. Why not? <laughs> you know, that'll be 10 less jobs. We have to worry about it. It expands, right? It sounds good on its surface, on its face. But the truth is, there's a significant amount of risk for fraud when what with one to four medical direction practice. And there's a study that was done by a guy named Epstein, who is a physician anesthesiologist from my alma mater, uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Pennsylvania, where they never do more than one to two supervision ratio there. So it's super inefficient where they showed on average there was a ton of fraud risk. So what they found is that in a one to two ratio, there's Medicare fraud about 35% of the time. And in one to three or greater, it's 99 to 100% of the time. So they are not meeting the requirements of medical direction, which are the seven TEFRA rules. Be there for induction, be there for the critical portions of the case, prescribe the plan, be there for emergence. Now, just to be clear, induction is obvious, right? You show up, they, you know, the CRNA or the AA intubate that puts an LMA in. Um, critical portions of the case, you can make an argument that extubation is part of a critical portion of the case. Uh, that's a that's that's where bad things can happen, take off and landing. Emergence is the process until uh, leaving the actual um, PACU. So they can see them as long as they're within that process for emergence. So in order to avoid that, what this study found is you either had to do a one-to-one -one ratio well, then why wouldn't the physician just do the case? I and mean, there's no point in that. A one to two ratio with staggered start times, which means that fewer cases will be done per day, that decreases access, increases wait times, and overall cost of care increases, and a backlog of surgical cases occurs. So that really doesn't expand access to care. In fact, it does the opposite. Instead, what's really happening is a ton of Medicare fraud. Uh, but, you know, it has to be reported for it to matter. Some of the things you can consider doing is limiting the AA ratio. I mentioned how that's, you know, a year-on-year -year cost after an AAs get in, they try to expand it. Um, you can make requirements prohibitive. You can do things like require, like uh, Kentucky did, require that AAs are licensed as PAs and or that their licenses are RNs or RTs or any kind of four-year uh, healthcare degree because it, it's a barrier to them coming. They're not going to maintain two licensures if they can go somewhere else and just have one. So it'll decrease the impact. Um, on CRNAs in the state. Uh, that's what I was saying about Kentucky. The AAs had to be PAs. So that's one, one example there. You can outlaw legislation. Louisiana is the only state in the country. It's outlawed um, AAs from existing, but they did that long before any of this was a big issue and AAs practically didn't exist across the country. It was 350 of them. So it was an easy thing to do. It would never happen again. I, I don't see a chance where you could AA um, AA, uh, outlaw AAs entirely from state. That was in 2004, they did that. Some other options, you know, AA students should only be taught by physician anesthesiologists. If I can't supervise them, then why should I be the one to train them? Doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Um, and boards of nursing can prohibit CRNAs from training AA students as they did in Florida. We actually have position statements at the ANA suggesting that we can train, CRNAs can train physician anesthesiologist residents and we can train our own residents, but we cannot train AAs because they're dependent providers who can only work with physician anesthesiologists. So our recommendation, we can't obviously say you can't because that would be a violation of federal trade. But what we can say is we recommend. A lot of argument about that. Well, we teach medical students, we teach medical students come in and intubate, but they're only learning skills. They're not learning anesthesia. We train our nurse anesthesia residents, but they're licensed providers before they ever come to us. So it's nothing new. Obviously wanna require public reporting. Things like delegate, delegation states get real complicated. You know, are unlicensed providers allowed to give or check out drugs that are, are, um, are controlled like narcotics? 
Uh, can they hand a, turn a case over to a licensed provider like a CRNA? Is that okay? And can unlicensed provider bill in insurance in the state? In some states, they can't. In Kansas is an example of that. You know, what's the risk to the facility if there are non-licensed providers? That's why they all in delegatory states want to shift to uh, um, uh, licensure. That's their goal because of that issue. Facilities not wanting to take any additional risk. And MDAs, the physician anesthesiologists, are totally at, at, at risk with AAs. So those are some of the concerns in delegation states. Uh, some of the other options, you can limit who can supervise an AA. New Mexico actually limited to board certified MDs, but not DOs, which I thought was hilarious. That lobbyist is a genius. Um, probably wouldn't work the second time, but it was good when they did. They also limited them to class A counties, which is populations over 100,000. So AAs could only work originally in the University of New Mexico. And then they fought for a bill to expand out there and they required them to be in class A counties. There's only two of them in the state. So there's not a lot in that state. Your state would be different, but in that case, it worked for them. And the thing is, AAs and P competition, really, that's the bottom line. You know, they're not flexible. They can't expand access to care. They can't do it in a fiscally responsible way. And I, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. Let's see if it plays for you. This is a cartoon that I created to explain exactly that. Let me see. Did you hear any of that? Okay, let me do it with the, uh, change the Zoom settings and you'll be able to hear it. That's the problem there. Okay, now you'll be able to hear it. All right, can you still hear me? All right, here we go. Imagine two carpenters working in a competitive market. Both carpenters go to different types of carpentry schools, but learn with the same tools that everyone uses. Though they trained in two different types of schools, they both produce the same high quality furniture with access to all the same tools. They compete equally in the market. The federal government gives the MDA carpenter access to a magical hammer only MDA carpenters can use. Now that the MDA carpenter has this magical hammer, he can make four chairs to the CRNA carpenters one, gaining an artificial competitive advantage from the federal government. This is why anesthesiologist assistants are anti-competitive. They're a tool given by the federal government only to one provider. A tool cannot compete with a carpenter because it cannot work on its own. CRNAs and MDAs compete directly, but AAs must always work under MDAs, allowing them an unfair market advantage. So I created that cartoon in order to show to legislators why it's anti-competitive, because to explain it to them gets in the weeds, but this is easy, right? It quickly gets across the concept that, yeah, it's not it's not fair to give a business an un, unfair competitive advantage. And in every state in the country, CRNAs compete for contracts against physician anesthesiologists. So there, there's a clear anti-competitive um, side to this. One of the biggest things is they fail to meet demands AAs. They cannot expand access. So if you're in an anesthesia care team and they have an additional case they want to add on, but they don't have an extra physician anesthesiologist with AAs to supervise or medically direct that AA, you can't open another room. There's just no way to do it. And so CRNAs can do that. So even, you know, even in an anesthesia care team, CRNAs independently practice. They're independent practice CRNAs. Regardless of the model, they're trained and capable of doing that, but also can build to do it. AAs cannot in any of those cases. There's a lot of economic impact, tons of subsidies. You're seeing was a hundred and some odd rural facilities closed over the last few years. And that's because of economic pressure in healthcare. And so CRNAs are an answer to that. Um, you got to regulate them, right? There's a cost to regulating AAs, a cost to the state, a cost to licensure, all those things. Those state funds would be better used. And here we placed it in a bill this year supporting CRNA uh, residency. So the the programs will get economic support from the state to help um, increase the amount of CRNAs who we produce here in the state, because ultimately that's the people who are going to expand access to care. 
So one of the things, some of the things we do for legislators, we create a big map of CRNA only practice and show them like in, in the state, how many counties have how many anesthesiologists, how many nurse anesthesiologists, how many practices that are CRNA only autonomous places where AAs can't work. And we starkly color those differently from the places where it's all anesthesia care team, which almost no county has only anesthesia care team in most states. So it's difficult uh, for them to say that it's really going to change access to the places that need it most, right? The under, underserved, underinsured, uh, economically disadvantaged, and rural areas. Obviously, lobbyists know this key contacts and grassroots efforts, efforts at the Capitol matter. You know, I mean, I can text half of our legislators here. We're Facebook friends. So when the AA bills and I message comes and I message them, they're like, yeah, we'll do what we can to get rid of that. You know, I mean, that's the kind of contact you have from going to their parties, from hanging out with them. Yeah, I mean, most of them are pretty cool people. So you get the opportunity to get an attachment there. Those efforts matter when you go to make an ask. Have, we've had a lot of uh, um, legislators in our state come do uh, um, shadowing with independent CRNAs. So I had Jeff Flake, who was a senator and a congressman at one point, and Tom O'Halloran, who was a congressman, come shadow and see it. I took care of Jeff Flake's dad, and he wrote about it um, in, in the Hill uh, newsletter about how independent practice CRNAs are an answer to the VA shortage of anesthesia providers. Obviously, I have to have strong leadership. That's clear. Make contacts with agencies who can sign on and help you against the AA bill. Rural hospital associations are one. The hospital association probably at best is going to go neutral. Uh, podiatrists feel like the redheaded stepchild of medicine, so they're often on board with us. Uh, dental associations, they may be on board. It depends. The PA association, we've got involved with them this year. They've been super helpful. Got to have a state pack, right? That's obvious. Uh, money doesn't buy you what you want, but money certainly opens the door to have the conversation. And that's what matters. And we should be politically active as best as we can. This is just the PAC report here in Arizona to show the difference. PACs are obviously out there. Anyone can look them up. They're public information. We uh, raise more money than the ASA, the, the MDA Association, and the Dental Association combined in this state in our PAC. So, you know, money talks. Right, it gets the doors open for us. And of course, the lobbyists are key. You got to have a good lobbyist. Lobbyists have the connections, understand the machinations and things that happen at the Capitol and the way things work. It's shocking how twisted politics can be. I mean, our AA bill didn't go to the health committee where all of our friends are. It went to the education committee in Arizona. And why? Because the sponsor, who's a freshman legislator who's trying to make her mark, is the chair of that education committee. So... Pulled a favor, moved it to a committee where it clearly shouldn't be. It's licensure of a healthcare provider. Uh, and that's where it is right now. This is its second committee. The first committee was the regulatory committee. Also didn't make any sense. So that's the kind of stuff you'll see happen. But your lobbyists can help you navigate those things. Get political think tanks involved. Any, anyone who recognizes anti-competition, so that's going to be libertarian, Republican think tanks. Anyone who recognizes the importance of expanded access to care, fiscally responsible, that's going to be any Democratic uh, think tank. And of course, hospital administrators writing letters is key. So that's all about controlling the narrative, right? We got to follow our own rules. We say we can't, um, we can't, uh, you know, go ahead and um, say bad things about them. But we also shouldn't be teaching them because we can't supervise them. And then this is an interesting thing that's happening recently. So because of this decreased access to care in probably one of the biggest air anesthesia care team states in the country, Florida, uh, a new company called Sound Anesthesia just bought, just started taking contracts and they don't hire AAs and they use CRNAs to full scope of practice and collaborative models because it's cost effective and it expands access to care. So they fired six AAs when they took over the contract because they're not flexible, right? This is just what Jeff Flake wrote. I'm going to skip through a couple of these things. All right. So a lot of people in your state will say things like, oh, you know, but does it really matter how, you know, AAs, does it really matter? It's not a big deal, right? There's only like, you know, 3,400 AAs now is about 2% of the providers, 350 graduating, only 12 schools. They're failing. But in 1992, there's 119 AAs in the country, right? In 2015, there was only 1,600 with 195 graduating, that's a 1300% and 680% growth over that period of time. So they're moving and it's grown that much almost again in the last decade, pretty significant. In fact, there's the Anesthesia Almanac number shows that AAs are the fastest growing as far as numbers from where they were. 
Uh, that's a big shift. And that's all about controlling the marketplace, right? This is what you use for your members to get them motivated. And I'll give you all these slides. In the University of Mexico, over 16 years that they had AAs, uh, it was all CRNAs and MDAs and an anesthesia care team. Today has zero CRNAs there. There are none working of 42 people uh, doing anesthesia, 42. So that's a big drop. Wisconsin, same thing. Half of them are AAs. Um, Georgia, more than three quarters are AAs. Half of them are AAs in Florida. Uh, in Indiana, they were saying they'd rather have AAs at this particular practice. They're hiring four AAs. They didn't offer the job to CRNAs. So obviously there's risks there. You know, every time AAs enter a state, uh, it impacts the model and it increases cost. In our bill, they actually literally wrote in the bill that it would drop salaries, <laughs> which it doesn't, right? So, you know, they're not going to, 3,400 AAs across the country aren't going to change the cost of anesthesia services. Uh, so, well, you know, what are the real risks? The risks are it's anti-competitive. There's already a solution in the state. There's two of them. Have everyone sit the stool. And additionally, to have everyone sit the stool is to have our nurse anesthesia residents in every practice working in a one to two. That's free, free um, access, really. So that's a quick review. And I know it's a lot. Um, but I'll open it up now to questions and what you want to ask me, and I'll do my best to help. What questions do you have? Thanks so much, Mike. This was this was really helpful. I think one of the things that I bring up um, anytime AAs are mentioned is like just the numbers. Um, and I know you had some of those in there, you know, about 3,000 or so AAs in the country. The AA and, or the NVCRNA, mm -hmm. we certify over 2,000 CRNAs a year. Um, so as far as like a pipeline of providers, you should bet your money on CRNAs. But in the states that have AAs, my understanding is that it's kind of small groups, like small pockets. And so once AAs come into an institution, there's like a whole clump of them in that one place. But as far as numbers within the entire state, you're not actually really filling a need more than really in just that one hospital. Is that is that a correct assessment? Yeah, there's still whole hospital systems in Florida after all this time that don't use AAs. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that tomorrow anything's going to change or the next five years or in Florida's case, the next 15 years, there's going to be a significant shift. And in fact, the opposite is happening there now is you've got companies. So these are commercial anesthesia management companies that are in the business of making quarter on quarter profits for their investors. They don't care about our battle. Right. But what they do recognize is that they can expand access, cover contracts and decrease costs. In other words, increase revenue by using CRNAs to full scope of practice. So A's are actually being displaced in some facilities in Florida because they don't help the access issue. Right. And so clearly it's not changed. And if you look at um, states where AAs have come in, there's they haven't changed access in any way, in any meaningful way. Like you said, they work in small pockets, but in addition to that, they only work in places where physicians and anesthesiologists work, you know, and that's it. So you're talking urban big centers, and that's where it ends. Rarely are they outside of those areas. And so are they really expanding access to the places that need it most? No, not at all. Or the underprivileged community hospitals that are uh, not, don't got the best payer mix? You know, no, they're not expanding in there either. So the bottom line is, is they're really not doing any major change in the states they've been in for a decade plus. So if that's the case, how's it going to fix in a new state? It just doesn't make any sense. What else can I answer? So this is this is Dave, one of the um, lobbyists for the Illinois team. And I appreciate everything that you provided. Uh, definitely a lot there. Um, and I think a lot of, of references, um, really quick. So there was <laughs> very ironic that, uh, as we were talking an AA bill was filed, <laughs> um, uh, sponsored by Senator Castro, who is the head of the executive committee in the Senate. Um, what, I, I know you might've skipped over this. Do we have any supporting studies demonstrating the cost saving measures of, CRNAs compared to AAs. Yeah, we have are a bunch you aware of, them. of any? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we've developed like um, one sheets on it. We've we've got a couple of studies that were done. They're older, but they talk about the cost of anesthesia care teams versus you know independent practice or collaborative models. 
and we can get you all that through the ANA. I'll also provide you with, um, I don't know if you got, do you guys already have that, that uh, report that I made? So as an, I'll, I'll show you a quick example of this. I'll put it on the screen. So this is the, this is the report that I do every few months I update. It's all indexed and it goes through every single argument and every single uh, thing that they say, but additionally, it's referenced to the whole thing with uh, actual studies. So you can just click on them, it takes you to it. So I'll send you guys that and you can uh, use it any way you like. So you'll have you'll have that information. And then anything else that you're missing, all you guys have to do is reach out to the ANA. They have all the um, the studies packaged together. That's great. I, I appreciate that. Um, the topic in itself and what we're experiencing here in Illinois, it's, you know, it's complex, right? There's a over 20% of the legislature is brand new, right? Healthcare is very complex. And I, I put this in that bucket. And um, have you seen any practices in other states where messaging has resonated, especially with some of these newer members? That's a good question. I, I think that, so we have the same thing happening in Arizona. I think it's happening in a lot of states. There's a lot of newer members. There's been a lot of a churn this last election cycle. So uh, what the things that we've seen work the most has been three main topics. And of course, this depends on the legislator, as you well know, you're talking to and their political bent. Uh, one is anti-competitive fraud risk. Like, you know, listen, it, I, I'm all for bringing AAs into my state. I would write the bill but I need to be able to supervise them too, because otherwise you're giving them a competitive advantage. That's unfair to give that to my competitors. That's one that resonates with Republican, Libertarian and independence generally. Uh, the other one that we use all the time is you're harming the pipeline of providers who can actually train, who can actually do independent practice anesthesia, which means they can work everywhere, do everything and are not dependent on somebody who sits at a desk and gets paid 450,000 a year to not actually do anesthesia. And so that would be CRNAs, right? Because every OR that an AA is practicing in is an OR, a CRNA resident cannot be trained in. So we we don't allow per our, our accrediting agency, our resident, our nurse anesthesia residents, and I use residents because we're previously licensed. We're not students like AAs. They're not previously licensed. So our nurse anesthesia residents can't train in that OR if there's an AA in there. So every one you bring in actually decreases supply to the biggest workforce you have. There's more CRNAs than the other two providers combined. So that's that being the case, you're only harming the pipeline, but you're also damaging the pipeline to rural anesthesia areas, community hospitals that are expanding practice within, with, without anesthesia care teams. In other words, places that AAs cannot work. So that's that really resonates with Democrats generally because you know their perspective of limiting education would be that that's not right and it's gonna it's not cost effective it's also not expanding access to care to places that need it most the underserved right uh, the third the third area that we talk about all the time is um, you know the RNAs per CMS and in every state in the country can supervise two of our nurse anesthesia residents at the same time so you can open two ORs for the price of one to the facility or the anesthesia group. So every place that isn't training CRNA residents and isn't using them to some degree in a one to two ratio like that, are they really interested in solving the problems of shortages when they have the answers that already exist and they're not utilizing them? And the answer is no, right? Does that make sense, Dave? Yeah, that's perfect. I think that that totally makes sense, especially if the um... The compromising of the of the pipeline, the workforce pipeline, right? I mean, we keep hearing people talking about workforce, workforce, workforce. Okay, well, there are solutions <laughs> to this, right? And seeing right. legislation that comes out like this, it's just infuriating because you you know they're saying one thing, but then they're doing another thing, right? So it just it really really bothers yeah. me. So I appreciate that response. Can you go a little bit? And once again, this is maybe an obtuse question about the fraud risk, no, the Medicare okay. fraud risk. Yeah, how so the, how, how, is that, pretty how is that calculated? Yeah, how is that how is that seen? And obviously it's gonna be hard to point to empirical data if it's not reported. Mm -hmm. But wanna get your perspective so on it. I'll I'll start with I'll start with this. If you're Medicare, right, and you're paying hundred percent of an anesthesia bill, whether you have you know, CRNAs doing it ind independently or CRNAs working in an anesthesia care team, or you have an AA working in an anesthesia care team. 
if there's fraud out there, your interest in going after it is probably less than it would be for almost anything else. That's an important piece of information to understand the lens through which ultimately uh, the FTC is not interested in getting involved in it. The Medicare doesn't pursue it unless it's clear, clear evidence under CITAMs, right? So to explain the risk, physician anesthesiologists, when they are medically directing, and these are CMS regulations and requirements, conditions of participation uh, for billing anesthesia services or Part B. So when you're billing Medicare Part B as a physician anesthesiologist and you have up to four CRNAs or AAs working under you, then you are billing 50% for each of those cases. In other words, 200% of what you'd bill if you just sat the stool yourself. So there's a fiscal incentive to do it. Um, and those those AAs or CRNAs are billing the other half, right? So in that other half of billing, which may go to the hospital, it may go to the anesthesia group. It depends on how the you know what the the practice is set up. Doesn't really doesn't really matter. It still works that way. Uh, in order to do that, there was massive fraud in the '80s, where there'd be physician anesthesiologists from a golf course with 30, 40 CRNAs in an OR, and they would bill for them all. Right. Uh, and so TEFRA came along for anesthesia services or um, the, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. And so when that came along, it required seven things that a physician anesthesiologist must meet to build medical direction, which is up to one to four providers. And it's the only way that AAs can work. And some of those things are you have to be there for induction of the patient. That means getting them off to sleep for anesthesia. You have to prescribe the plan. Uh, you have to be there for critical portions of the case, and you have to be there for emergence and any needs in the in the recovery that is needed. Those are just a few of them, but they're the ones that are most salient. So the problem when you're in a one to four ratio is how can you be there for all these things if more than one of those things happens at the same time? So if you're in a hospital where you have, let's just make it four ORs, and the start time is 730 for all four cases, and you're a physician anesthesiologist with four AAs who cannot start the case without you, but you say, go ahead, go ahead and start and I'll pop in afterward and sign the chart after the fact, that's Medicare fraud, right? So that's a that's not just a risk to the physician anesthesiologist, that's a risk to the facility because the facility has a fiduciary duty to uh, the patients that come there that the conditions of participation for Medicare are met, including those of uh, Part A. So with a CRNA, how is that different? Well, with a CRNA, you can bill non-medically directed, it's called QZ billing. And you could say, hey, Julia, go start that case over there, bill it QZ, and the physician anesthesiologist never has to be involved, has no requirements to be involved from a billing perspective or conditions of participation part A perspective, B perspective. And so therefore, that case gets done, there's no fraud risk, everything's on up and up, up and up, and there's nothing illegal about it. And so that's in a nutshell the difference. Is that does that clarify it for you? That yeah, that's a perfect explanation. Thank you. That yeah. And if you clearer. need any more yeah. information, yeah, if you need any more information about this, uh, Julia can give you my number. I can talk to you one-on-one -on -one and I'll, I'll lay it out. I do this probably a thousand times in the last three or four years. So <laughs> I, for me, it, it's just, I don't even have to look at stuff anymore. It's just second nature. So I can explain it easier. And Mike, I no, know you've got it in your yeah. slides, but there was that one study that the ASA did that they admitted themselves that they were unable to do medical direction without a significant amount of fraud. That's correct. That's included in um, my uh, 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 AA report that I'll send you guys. And uh, that's called the Epstein study that was done in Pennsylvania at a one to four medical direction. It was done with CRNAs, but it's irrelevant because medical direction and CRNAs or AAs, they're blind to the CRNA or AA title it's billed and the requirements are the same. So it's 35% in a one to two ratio they're committing fraud and it's 99% or more in a one to three or one to four ratio that there's fraud. They're not meeting some of the conditions and so therefore there's fraud. What other questions can I answer? I don't have a time limit so I can do whatever. <laughs> uh, barely. If you want to type it in the box, if I can't hear you, I'll look there. I'll watch for that in the chat if you uh, type your question there. Anyone else have questions? Oh. 
Oh, I can hear you now. Mike, can you hear me by chance? I can, yep. Hello. Hi, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? Sorry, I'm on my phone. Um, anyways, I just want to say thank you for um, doing this presentation. It was great. Very informative to the point. I love it. And I love all your slides. I was trying to take pictures during the whole thing. Um, you know, I wanted to oh, know. I'll give you them um, all. <laughs> but no, I, I love that. And that's my next question is I wanted to know how can we get this so that we can show our, our board in Michigan and have this available um, for everyone to see? I can do a presentation for you guys if you want. I can give it to you. I talk more than what's actually on the slide usually. I don't really look at them. But I uh, I can provide that to you. I'll give you the information for the uh, the report that I do as well. That will give you some information. And it's a little different for you guys, obviously, because you have AAs under delegatory authority. So there's some other questions you have. And I'm sure you know all about the Travers City um, Kai Tam lawsuit that occurred there. And there was some question from the Board of Pharmacy that AAs could not actually be getting out or transferring uh any right. controlled substances and the pharmacist pharmacist the hospital was fired just by saying that that was had the level of control that was at that place <laughs> right i know we're expecting a a bill anytime and you know we also don't want to give them any kind of argument of why to license them so those things don't happen so it's a fine line of right. how we ask for it um, but anyways i would love to um, be able to share this presentation with the dialogue that you just had also um, for those that maybe can't attend. So I didn't know where this was going to be available. Is it on the a, &A website, do you know, or? No, so uh, I know they're recording it and they're more than, they're, if they want to give that recording to you guys, that's totally fine. Yeah, I can I can provide that for sure. Oh, that'd be great. So this way people can watch it on their own time and whatnot, because I know some people weren't able to make it on this um, webinar. Yeah, sure, no problem. And um, also, if you could, we're expecting possibly um, like an AE school opening, um, if you had any kind of, um, you know, resources on that as well. I did write down some of the stuff that you said, but additional information on that as well. Yeah, I think some of the keys to, to universities open an AE program depends on whether it's private, for profit, or if it's a, a state university. Some are a little bit more focused on finances and other are focused on um, social issues. So it, as an example, you know, the University of Arizona was talking about opening one here. And when we went and talked to them, the benefit was I knew the, the vice provost relatively well. We used to fly in a helicopter together. So when we had a conversation, I just said, listen, you know, this is this is what they are, where they were sold a total bill of goods about how basically these guys were PAs and you already have a PA program. So you should just allow this additional PA track. When they found out that that wasn't the case, you know, that they weren't PAs and that they don't work everywhere. They weren't even licensed in the state. They didn't know any of this. They were already in the beginning stages. After that, they ended the, the, the school. So I think the key is, is, you know, look, if you have a nursing program or you support nurses in your state, and who's going to say they don't support nurses in their state? Nobody. Uh, then this is not going to be supporting nurses. If you want to open a program, you should open a CRNA program that can actually expand access to care. Uh, I think that has worked for us now twice, that kind of argument. Okay, that's great. I did write them a, a letter that's being reviewed by the a and and our attorney currently, and it basically says that exact same thing. So, great. Excellent. What other questions you guys have? Ask so, away. Mike, this is Jody Emerson, and this is actually going Hi, to Jody. kind of update you on what's happening um, in Michigan. They are trying to create an anesthesia tech program on the west side of the state where it's a hotbed for mm. delegatory authority for the AAs. So by creating this anesthesia tech program, they're basically going to start coming at us with that argument that they have no history in healthcare. So just be on the lookout for this one. This is a play that we found out that they're really starting to work on in great effort in Michigan. That's popping yeah, up in Illinois too. That. My own, my own institution, the anesthesia techs, they're trying to get them all certified and to be certified, they have to go through this anesthesia tech program, which is pretty extensive. I don't know why anybody would do it, but I imagine that that's the angle that they're going to take. What other questions you guys have? There's no more questions. You can always get a hold of me. It's not hard. 
<laughs> I will help in any way I possibly can. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so You're much, welcome, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming on and listening and, and getting updated on this information. Thank